Hello and welcome to lesson number three. We are almost arriving at the end of this cycle of uh, lectures on um, ergonomics. And the topics addressed in the lesson today are affordances, usability and empathy. So these three concepts, affordances, usability and empathy, uh, they of course uh, have relevance in the context of uh, ergonomics since as you men as I mentioned before and you probably remember from the from the other lessons we we talked about ergonomics in the context of, of design so a broad view of the con of, of the topics of of design not just architecture and interior design but also product design uh, and these concepts of, of, of affordances have uh, been uh, widely uh, applied, especially in the field of uh, product design. So they have a strong connection with product design, industrial design. Uh, and so these ideas, uh, which, which I will uh, talk a little bit further uh, in this uh, video, have pretty much been, uh, been established uh, also with, with a focus on uh, ergonomics although some theories say that uh, in this case ergon ergonomics and human factors how it's called for example in the united states differ a little bit since ergonomics is more focused on the human and uh, on, on the human body and uh, human factors has this connotation very very connected to industry and to product design but nowadays we also don't make such a separation this was a bit of an old notion when there used to be also a little bit of difference of approach uh, to the to the to the idea of ergonomics uh, more uh, european and human factor is a more uh, american uh, approach nowadays we see this uh, we have a, a more global vision and we see we see we don't see so much differences between the two terms but in any case uh, theories of uh, affordances usability and empathy they uh, have been widely uh, been widely uh, applied in the context of uh, product design and 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 also they they originate in uh, the United States of course they have been uh, expanded pretty much expanded but the authors who have worked to develop these ideas um, are mostly um, American so um, I start with affordances. The theory of, of affordances was invented in uh, or, or started in uh, 1966 by uh, James uh, Gibson, who wrote uh, a book about the senses considered as perceptual systems. Uh, so Gibson was connected uh, to, to the field of um, human computer interaction in, in the very beginning. He was also very interested in ideas of ecology and of perception and of trying to understand how uh, psychology, percep uh, cognitive psychology, perceptual psychology, environmental, environmental psychology, industrial design, human computer interaction uh, and artificial intelligence could be combined uh, together. And he applied most of the, his theories uh, were applied most of all in the beginning in the field of uh, human computer uh, interaction. And of course, they have connections with, uh, with ergonomics and with uh, human factors, because as you know, as you learned from the other classes, ergonomics is not just about the possibilities of the body in motion, what we, we can uh, do and not do with our limbs, but also the psychological uh, dimension and also it of course has also to do with perception and with this uh, broader view of, of the human as a part of an ecological, uh, of an environment and so a kind of ecological system. You probably also remember from, from the lessons uh, when I mentioned before that when we talk about ergonomics we talk a lot about also about systems theory and we talk about how the human uh, the human integrated in diversified complex uh, uh, systems uh, not the human as a little cog in the system but the human as the user of a system so of course, these uh, theories of affordances, usability and empathy, which uh, I will talk about today, 
um, they have been applied first in the context of something called user-centered design and this is of course connected to an ergonomics in the sense that it puts the user in the focus so the user of a system in, in the focus that's what the system is meant for for the user uh, and nowadays the more current uh, theories uh, regarding to, to uh, interaction between between the human and, and uh, the env and environment built environment and the system um, they are not so much addressed as human as, as user-centered design but as human-centered design so this is the more current definition that that we use and and the perspective that we see that we see ergonomics and as you remember from the last lessons when i talked about for example the iso standard and so so all all these iso standards which are related for example to usability um, that set the guidelines uh, of what are the the ideal or the most optimal uh, solutions for for usability they are focused and they are proposed in this perspective of human-centered design uh, of course all these theories and all these definitions some of them are relatively new um, and they are not final terms they are they are of course open-ended the, these uh, definitions can change, they can uh, expand, they can acquire other meanings, other possibilities. Um, so probably in 10 years we will have new definitions and new uh, approaches, but this is the most uh, current uh, perspective. So starting with uh, affordances, I mentioned before, they, they were, the theory of affordances was started by Gibson. Um, and his uh, best known definition of the theory uh, of affordances comes from his book from 1979, which is called The Ecological Approach to Visual Perception. Uh, so Gibson was also interested in terms of psychology, but also in terms of behavior and in, in, in terms of um, to observe how uh, a human seen in this case from an ecological perspective as an animal, an animal with specific characteristics, how, how the human addresses the environment. So the theory of affordances, according to Gibson, or uh, the idea of affordances can be defined in this way. The affordances of the environment are what it offers the animal, what it provides or furnishes either for good or ill. The verb to afford is found in the dictionary. The, da the noun affordance is not. I have made it up. I mean by it something that refers to both the environment and the animal in a way that no existing term does. It implies the complementary of the animal and the environment. So, as you can see from Gibson's uh, definition, the idea, his idea was that uh, when an animal perceives an affordance in the environment, so basically the affordance is, I am in an environment and I see what I can and what I cannot do. And then I make my decisions or it conditions, it's, it's conditioning by my behavior. Uh, and then I make my decisions, um, how to act and what, and what to do. And possi possibly also, not possible but including also what i cannot do so for example when i see a chair and i often go go to the example of the chair uh, we know from learning that chair is an object to sit we learn as children the the motoric patterns that tell us uh, how how to sit in a chair depending of course on the culture and so on and so on but the same way that I know that I can sit on a chair, we also know that you can use a chair while, when being extremely angry or something in a very extreme aggressive situation to um, break something or to throw something. Of course, I say this is, as a comical extreme uh, situation. Um, for uh, an, an example, so affordances. All the things that when looking at an object, I perceive that I can and cannot do with it. 
So when we design an object, if we are thinking, of course, about affordances, normally we have an idea of how we want this object to be used, uh, how we want the person to adjust the body, and so on and so on. And if we design from a human-centered uh, perspective, um, we take in consideration, of course, the characteristics of the user, but we take in consideration that in the context, for example, of, of product design, if we want a, a product to be successful, we have to meet some requirements to make sure that some users or a niche of users or one user, if, the, if it's an item which is custom made, so specifically tailored to the needs of one user, we have to make sure that these needs are met through the design. So affordances in this case are important because that means that this object is materialized in a way that when the user has contact with it, it understands what can be done with this object, what cannot be done with this, with this object. So the theory of affordances was uh, also further developed. Uh, um, not only by Gibson but but by other authors. One one of his one of the authors who further developed the theory of affordances was his wife, Eleanor um, Gibson, who was very uh, interested in the idea of uh, affordances in the context of perceptual learning and uh, development. Uh, in 1988, this idea of affordances as perceived action possibilities uh, was further developed uh, and, and even uh, introduced by Donald Norman. So Donald Norman uh, is a very important author who had a very strong relevance in the field uh, of design. He wrote two books which, which really changed uh, the way we, we started to see and to work with design. And one, one of these books is called The Design of Everyday Things and the other one is called Emotional Design. So in, in, in The Design of Everyday Things, um, Norman uh, extended the idea of affordances. For Gibson, um, Gibson was interested in, in the action possibilities in general and Norman, may, uh, according to Norman's uh, theory, this idea of a Gibson had a more broad view of affordances, and and Norman made made this statement uh, that for him, the affordances are already so implied in the object that that the object already, at the same time, offers and restricts all possibilities of action. Uh, this is different from uh, from Gibson because Gibson had uh, had things more open. For for example, Gibson would say, "You enter into a room and see and see a chair and see a lamp, and you can sit on the lamp and you can tr try to turn on." the chair. So Gibson's idea was that theoretically you can use different actions than what the objects are intended to because somehow the object might give you the possibility of doing that. In this case you cannot turn on a chair, it wouldn't work, so that would not be an affordance. But you can sit on a lamp, although you would probably break it. You could have another example where, where it would work. You could have uh, a desk and you could have uh, a chair. So you would enter the room and you could sit on the desk and you could write on the chair and use it as a desk. So for Gibson, these would be affordances. Norman restricted this idea a little bit more and he said, no because we are always learning. So what happens is that unless I have some kind of cognitive uh, problem, I would enter into the room and I would know that the chair is to sit 
and I would know that the table is to write or to write on or to uh, eat or to, to use it in this uh, way because that's what I learned about this object and this is what I perceive immediately as affordances of the object. Of course this is true because normally that's how we think. But at the same time, and here I would like to keep it open because you have this exercise to do, to explore affordances. And I think that it's really interesting to keep in mind Gibson's idea, which is more open and more general, because I think it offers more creative possibilities. Because in fact, we are always transforming our environment. This is also something that Gibson uh, was was addressing with his uh, theory that uh, humans constantly transform the environment to better suit their needs. Uh, it's, it's a natural impulse. So when we find materials or objects or things, if, if, even if we know what they are, if they don't suit us, we are triggered to use our imagination to find other possibilities of use or how to adapt it in a way that would make it work better for us. So, of course, Norman also leaves this open, but I would like to give these things a little bit more room also to be, to be uh, discussed. But in any case, and now returning to, to Norman, Norman introduced also related to affordances, very important ideas uh, about uh, about the design and the design of everyday things because Norman was really interested in qualifying what makes a good design and what makes a bad design in the sense and for Norman for example um, some design pro uh, problems have to do with the difficulty that a user can have or a human can have in perceiving the affordances of an object uh, and this was specific, specifically important in the context of uh, human-computer interaction uh, because if you design an artifact, which in the 70s, for example, is com completely new, like a computer and so on, if it's something people are not used to, you have, if it's a new object, you have to give them something that they somehow already understand how to work with. So the first computers, of course, take reference from the typewriter. And we see now how it uh, evolved with with all the with all the technology we have. That we st we have phones, and even in our phone, that uh, most of them work with with the finger. And before, when when it wasn't a touch screen, when it was real buttons, they had in small in a small scale still the the keyboard. So we are still coming, okay, referring to this because. It's a, a constantly learning uh, process and it's a constant convention. So in this case, yes, of course, Norman is right when he says that we know how to use, that we should use an object in that way because we learned the affordances of such an object before. So even seeing something new, we know how relatively well how to use it. And depending how successful or unsuccessful a design can be, a design object can be. Um, ideally, the, the affordances have to be perceivable. So this is one point. How do we transport this in the context of uh, architecture and interior design? Of course, in interior design, we can, we can start, for example, with um, simple elements and also in architecture, we can talk about the window, we can talk about the door. Uh, we can talk about um, a kitchen, a kitchen unit. We can talk about, uh, for example, in in the in the bathroom. All these objects and how we define the interior and how these objects are are arranged. They are always giving us cues, so giving us hints on on how they are used. So the affordances are implicit in the objects, and they are also implicit. In the, in the way the objects are placed in the room. So when we are designing an interior space, we are telling people what to do in a way, but we are also inviting them to use the space in a certain way. 
when we do this with furniture and if the fur if the furniture for example is not uh, heavy and it's if it's not nailed or glued or or completely fixed to the ground we can we offer possibilities of use we offered so to say the, um, the script of affordances of what can be done with the, those objects in that design in that configuration in that space but the user is always free to change it to change the affordances for example in a kitchen unit this is different most kitchen units have the components in a fixed space and due to the to the plugs and to all, all these things that we don't change easily the electricity plug and the the water uh, supply and all these things they are fixed so there we already know that in this case the the affordances are clear what can be done and what what cannot be done although of course if we open the cabinets and so we can always change where, where the objects go and so on and so on. But these are, these are also um, affordances. Um, affordances also have, for example, another author, William Gaffer, divided affordances into three categories. And affordances can be, according to Gaffer, uh, perceptible, hidden or false. What does this mean? A false affordance is something that is apparent, but it doesn't have any real function, which means that the actor, the person who is performing with the object, the actor thinks, oh, it is possible to do this, but then when, try when trying to do it, oh no, I was tricked, it's, it's not possible. And this, for example, going, going back to the um, to the example of the kitchen it could be a, a drawer which which has a handle and w looks exactly like all the other drawers but when you go to open it, it it's not opening anywhere because it wasn't a drawer so um, in older kitchen designs in, in the 80s and in the 90s I still saw this in some places that there would be a a kind of a, a, a fake drawer that was used for to keep the the facade of of, of the of the cupboard uh, uh, with a kind of unified design but there there was a pipe or or there was something back so it wouldn't be able to function as an actual uh, drawer and it was just there for optical uh, clarity and so on of course these things happen less and less uh, because uh, people, uh, we designers, we are much more aware that it's not necessary to, we should be much more aware that it's not necessary to give false affordances uh, and why? Because a false affordance will frustrate the user um, because the user in a hurry or so will try to open something that it doesn't work. Uh, and of course, when we design something, we want to give possibilities as much as possible and we want things to run smoothly and we don't want to create frustration uh, in daily life. Quite the opposite. We want to, to reduce this kind of frustration as much as possible, unless we are working in a playful way and we are doing some kind of installation or, or a game that we on purpose want to use the idea of false affordances um, for, a, for, for with the specific intention of creating uh, a comical or, or aesthetic or whatever situation. But if we are designing for a user in normal life, in reality, we want to avoid false affordances as much as possible. Because a false affordance, for example, can even create a dangerous situation. A false affordance can also be a fake button uh, in something. So you, you can have a a uh, mobile phone or something that would have a button that doesn't work but it's there for optical correction or something like that this also happened for example i remember in the in the 80s and also in the 90s remote controls that had an or, or tv old tvs that had fake buttons also just for uh, visual visual coherence and uh, of course you don't want to create uh, a false affordance it doesn't make any sense so as designers we have to we have to be 
uh, very aware that it's uh, important that the design is clear for the user and it doesn't make any misunderstandings. So this for false affordances. Um, a hidden affordance, which is much more interesting than a false affordance, refers to a possibility for action which might be in an object that we don't immediately see. So, for example, going back to the example of I gave before of the chair, I can use a chair to sit, but I can also use it to break a window or, 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 or throw it at someone if I am really, really angry and so on. Of course, I'm not encouraging anyone to do any of these actions, but it is possible. It's possible to do so. It's a hidden affordance. Another hidden affordance would be to be doing an installation, for example, and using unconventional materials or a performance or something and saying, I want to use a toothpaste tube and this toothpaste as my drawing and painting material. And I will do this on the glass of, of my uh, douche uh, shower cabin at home and use it in this way. This is a hidden affordance for both, for both the objects involved. Um, another hidden affordance would be, after it's done, to decide to clean the glass using the same toothpaste uh, tube and to using this top as a spatula and use it to clean the dry toothpaste from the glass. That's another hidden affordance. Why do I come up with this example? <laughs> because I actually did this last week. I'm pre preparing another course that I'm also working with uh, performance art to, to uh, explore these ideas of interaction of body and space. And of course, this idea of affordances is, uh, is, uh, is a part of it. And in the references I gave you, you saw probably the, the videos and the work of Matthew Barney, Marina Abramovic, and also Erwin Wurm, just to give some examples. And all these hidden affordances are completely obvious. So for example, Matthew Barney works, just like I mentioned before, with um, unconventional drawing uh, or painting materials, but materials which have a significance in his personal life, his background as an athlete, but, but also his life as an artist. So he paints and draws and makes sculpture with uh, petroleum jelly. In this case, petroleum jelly, which was something that he used to lubricate his body when, when he was a football player. And this is incorporated into, into the narrative of his artwork and in the repertoire of his, of his uh, uh, artistic uh, materials. So th this is also an affordance of the material. Also in the case of the work of Matthew Barney, which is very spatial, it always works. He makes uh, performances and installations always in, in connections to architecture space and then to, um, so working with a lot with the room also. And in his ongoing series, uh, Drawing uh, Restraint, he really works with this idea of, of, of affordances by exploring what the body can do under so the efforts that the body can do under self-imposed rest restraints so he's he's um, designing the restrictions and then the restric restrictive situations that the body will be performing in and um, and then he leaves a mark in the space by performing under these conditions. So you probably saw the videos which, which I linked on the Moodle platform. You can also find it in YouTube, some videos and Matthew Barney talking about his ideas on drawing restraint. But you see uh, that often he de devises, he designs these really complicated, uh, complex uh, settings, but with very simple, sometimes with very simple elements. So the floor, for example, become uh, is installed with a um, with a trampoline and uh, in, in one of these installations and you he uses the trampoline to jump so at the same time this gives him the affordance of jumping of going high 
and with a brush and trying to leave a mark in the in the ceiling in in the top in the top of the room and this is his drawing so hidden affordances you can use a trampoline to make artwork and you can use a brush to paint in the ceiling while jumping on a trampoline these are affordances so but they are these are the affordances that perhaps we would not see and come up with uh, immediately so this is why i said before that when we talk the difference between um, gibson's and norman's uh, approach to the idea of affordances i i personally still am closer to the to the idea of uh, gibson which is more broad because we should never and although of course we are always learning about uh, what we can or cannot do with the objects in our surroundings but we, we humans we are incredibly creative and we can always come up with finding some hidden affordances in objects that we would not uh, think about so this this is one of the of the examples um, yeah, so about about uh, affordances, this is uh, pretty pretty much what I what I wanted to uh, what I wanted to discuss. And now, of course, connected with the topic of affordances is also the topic of usability. And what is the difference between? Of course, usability and affordances are connected, but usability. Uh, can be seen more from this uh, perspective of the standards of what of what uh, of what is required from a design from from the point of view of standards. So the, as I mentioned before, the ISO standards really uh, take very seriously this uh, idea of usability. So a definition of usability, which. Uh, Often uh, many people uh, connect this idea of usability by calling it user-friendly. So it means that uh, it's, it's easy and efficient for a user to understand how to approach this design new uh, object. So a definition would be usability can be described as the capacity of a system to provide a condition for its users to perform the tasks safely effectively and efficiently while enjoying the experience. So this is of course connected to what I mentioned before about uh, user-centered design and here we have again this connection to the more contemporary views on um, ergonomics. So it's, it's important in terms of usability and user-centered uh, design uh, it's, it's important not just that an object is more efficient to use, so it takes less time to accomplish a task. It, it takes less time, for example, to open a door, to, to turn a door, a door handle and, and open it. Um, it's easier to learn. The operation can be learned just by observing, so it doesn't take any instruction. It's not necessary that someone comes and say, oh, you have to use it. In this in this way uh, and it's also more satisfying so and this is really the difference also from from the very beginnings of the of the theory of ergonomics and, and human factors it's not only important that the object uh, that that it's efficient and it's easy to learn but that it's enjoyable that the experience of doing these things is nice that it feels good and that it uh, gives pleasure that it's uh, rewarding and because the more the more we are happy about using and interacting with the design um, the more we enjoy using this design and, and the, the better connection we have and, and the better we perform the tasks we have to perform so for example if, if I work um, with a uh, pen just giving the example example of the pen i can have a pen which works fine i can i can write with this pen and the ink is okay uh, and i i don't have to do any specific uh, weird or complicated task to make it work either i open it quickly or 
and so on and so on. So it can be something very simple. Or I can have a pen, which when I touch it, it feels really nicely in my hand because the surface is very finely worked. It's a material that has a good, uh, that has a good feel to the touch, that it has a good feel of temperature when I, when I hold it, that it has a weight which is appropriate for my hand, which the size fits nicely to my hand, that I even enjoy the sound this pen makes while, while uh, being on the paper, uh, that the ink doesn't make uh, problems, uh, or eventually even that when, when I want to use this pen, that maybe the, the way I open it, it's a nice ritual because it flows very nicely, or, or the way I press it and so makes a nice sound and I don't have to make so much force. So all these, of course a pen is, a, is, a, is an example that can, you can see all these different, different levels of, of uh, fineness uh, in the design. The same you could use, this, this to give you an example of a very small scale. Um, and this, don't underestimate the small scale because the small scale can be definitely the most complex and the most difficult to do. And you see it, for example, with, with uh, watches and other, other products like this, that the more uh, refined and sophisticated the design, then often it also happens that, that there's price uh, differences. Uh, but we are not here addressing specifically this. We will put it again in the context of um, interior design. So transporting these ideas for a space. Uh, it's not just important that things are distributed nicely in the space, that I can, that, that, that I can move efficiently in my room, that I, that I have space to put all my books, that I know how the door works and how the window uh, works. Yes, there's light. Yes, I can control the temperature. Uh, yes, I can have a glass of water and I, I, I can have privacy. But this is the minimum. It's not enough that it's safe and effective and efficiently. It has to be enjoyable. So this is really the difference between something that works and works well or something that is a user-friendly, human, human-centered uh, human centered design. So the human-centered has this component. In the case of uh, architectural and interior design, it has to do with this capacity of making an empathic, emotional connection with the human, with the user. So that the user, first of all, connects emotionally with the space that the space somehow or, or the room, uh, for example, if it's, if it's uh, at home, that this room expresses who, who she or he is as a person that offers uh, comfort and security, but also uh, complexity of, of uh, stimulation, that uh, the whole sensorium is, is uh, taken care of so that the smells in the, uh, from the materials and the colors and all these factors we mentioned before, the light, no noise and so on and so on. But also ideally that the, the objects that, that also make the interior design, the chairs and the tables and perhaps the carpets and the shelves and you know going through all and all these details that they offer the possibility of being enjoyable to use and enjoyable to look at and give and, and also to give a sense of place and a sense of meaning and uh, a positive uh, experience. So this just to put this idea of usability also in the context of, of uh, architecture and uh, interior, interior design. Often when we talk about uh, usability we are we are also talking about um, we are also talking about you probably already heard about uh, intuitive design and this is uh, if a design is intuitive uh, and this is also something that that Norman also uh, talk, talked about so 
And this is the capacity that an, an object or, or designed uh, situation has uh, that, that the user doesn't have to be explained how, how to work or with a minimum, ideally a really, really good design is self-explanatory. You see it and you know as much as possible how, how it works. You perceive the affordances uh, as soon as possible. You don't need anyone to um, explain you or give you an instruction on how it works. You memorize also. So even if you're not interacting with this thing for a long time, when you go back to it, you already know, you remember quickly uh, how, uh, how it's uh, done. Uh, you don't make many errors while using it because how often it happens when we are interacting with a with a space or, or we are interacting in an object, if we have a tendency of performing the same error in that situation, in that room or with that object, we will create a negative association with that interaction. And that's never a good thing in the case of design. Because then we have two options. Either the person who is frustrated with the interaction will want to change the, the, this design for something else, so the product failed in that way, or the person might not have the possibility of changing it for a number of different reasons, which could be economic factors or, or no time or too many things to do and then just accepting that it's there and one doesn't have a positive interaction with it. But these things have a psychological impact. They lead to frustration and everybody knows that frustration building up doesn't really lead to good things. Um, and as we learn from ergonomics, we don't want to on purpose create these situations unless we are doing a performance like Matthew Barney and we want to create restrictions and frustrations on person because we want to do it as creativity, motor for our creativity to leave a mark. But that's a specific situation. I will give an example. In my home, for example, uh, in my bedroom, I had for some time a um, blinder from a very known uh, from a very known company, which everybody uses. Probably <laughs> most people have some things from this company at home, uh, and it is a good design and it is an, intu uh, an intuitive system. But for some reason, I have a personal tendency for when pulling this thing down, supposedly when you pull it down, when you put this blinder down, it goes, it goes up and you release it, it goes up again very, very quickly. And this is very satisfying when it works. For some reason, in my bedroom, I have two of these. I have two windows and I have two of these. The one on the right side works fine. You put it down and then you release it and it goes up. The one on the left side never works like that. I don't understand exactly why, but for some reason it, it has to be operated in a slightly different angle than the other one, which is exactly the same model, to be able to function. But until I recognized that, because I'm of course, as you probably already realized, interested in interactions and objects and affordances and so on, uh, for a long time, I thought, where does this error come from? Am, am I not performing the, the task correctly or is this a problem in the design? But then I have, I have two objects which are designed in the same way, but so probably one of them has a small manufacturing uh, mistake, which was giving me frustration, frustration in use. This is one example of how something in terms of usability uh, might not work. And if you don't have satisfaction when using the design, you can just decide, okay, I, I, I don't want to put myself through this frustrating situation anymore and I will just change it. Um, but then we can see these things from a wider and wider perspective, because if we think about sustainability and if we think about product design, uh, we also, can imagine how many products were already designed that were poorly designed, took resources, time, space, 
marketing and all these things to come into people's lives and maybe they didn't work well or they were not accepted and so on and they became trash very very quickly and where does this trash go oh supposedly some of them are recyclable more energy to transform to transform these failed design objects into something else this is not sustainable obviously we have to think about other solutions so it's really really important that during the design process these aspects of usability uh, are uh, already uh, addressed of course through uh, prototyping and one of the strategies which uh, which is uh, has been recently also introduced in in the united states and also in sweden and more, more generally now um, in in europe is an approach to uh, usability and to to human-centered design focused on user experience which means that very often users are incorporated in the design of the products so they are not just at the end of the line receiving a product which was prepared uh, or, or a space or an environment which was prepared for the needs they are involved in the design process so this is called participatory design or collaborative design and in this situation what happens is that the human the actor the user is involved in the design and his experience is fundamental first of all to understand what what are the, the person's needs what has to be addressed through a design how can the person execute the tasks and what what tasks are necessary and important and pleasant to be done and the design is directly addressing these requirements while having the user experiencing the preliminary solutions and at the same time the user proposing what could be the design of course this is not <laughs> what many designers or especially architects and interior designers like to do often we like to have creative control and we think oh no 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 i studied design and i know exactly what i the, the user is not informed and they don't really know what they need and so on and so on and it might be the case that the user might have problems that they don't even know because they are so used to having what they have at their disposal and in that case we the designers we have the task of saying i observed your behavior and your environment and i know how to improve your life and and so that's why it is a participatory collaborative uh, process which can be very uh, satisfying so this is also one of the one of the possibilities and now since we are almost reaching the end of our video I would like to use now uh, to introduce now the since we are talking about user experience so the experience of of, of the person with the design objects or the interior space or the, the architecture and we can of course also put it in a in an urban urban scale I would like to finish the video addressing the idea of empathy so these ideas of uh, empathy they also were connected with the, with the work of uh, Norman uh, as I mentioned before um, these two books from Norman so the design of everyday things but also another one called emotional design and emotional design for Norman is uh, uh, so Norman really addressed this uh, dimension we have of connecting uh, not just through efficiency but also through our uh, emotions. We establish emotional relationships with our environment. Everybody has a favorite chair or a, and a favorite seat and my favorite handy and my favorite mug or... So basically all the objects we, we use, m many of us are lucky enough to be able to, to choose them and with the, with the market nowadays, there's a lot of options of, of choice and um, the more positive and the better our interactions with with the environment and uh, with the objects of everyday life the stronger the emotional bond is of course this idea of emotional design 
has also been used widely used by marketing and branding to uh, establish uh, cu customer loyalty so loyalty to a brand and loyalty to a product so this of course has been used uh, used consciously to also to, to sell uh, products uh, but the whole idea of, of emotional design and of uh, empathy through design, if you see it from a human-centered perspective, has to do with addressing the needs of, of the user, of, of the human, uh, not just the functional needs, but also the emotional needs. And at the same time, offering products and environments that represent uh, a user's uh, the the user's uh, sense of self or helping with the, the, to create a sense of self, but also a sense of place, a sense of connection. Uh, so, for example, with wood buildings, this is really important, not just the home. And nowadays, since we we have been experiencing this um, this really restrictive situation, do due to the quarantines and to the lockdowns, um, we really understand through the deprivation how important it is, uh, how important are our connections to, to buildings and to rooms and spaces which are not just our homes. So we can also, we also make ourselves in many ways at home and we feel connected. Uh, with uh, with other other buildings of course the home can can be the most important but we can be equally empathically connected to the workspace to the building where we study um, to a sacral building a church or a mosque or to a coffee uh, coffee shop or um, uh, ha hairdressers salon or, or a gym or a mineral bath we have here in Stuttgart and of course a theater, a cinema, a gallery, so a, a library. So all these um, spaces and all these buildings, which which are if they are especially if they are well designed, if they are good design, um, all these spaces which gives us a possibility of em emotional connection. And we do this through a process of empathy. And empathy means the capacity the capacity that a human has to transport his own feelings into an object. And it, it can be a, a person, so in this case, when the communication works, the feelings of empathy means that I can feel, um, I can empathize and I, I can feel the feelings uh, of another person and, and in that way establish, some, establish a bond. In the case of emotion design, it means I can transport myself into this object. I can see parts of myself into this object or, the, or in this building and here feel um, connected. So this source of, of connection. Um, and of course, this can also be naturally uh, transported to uh, the urban space, uh, square or uh, even uh, a street walk, all these uh, things, depending of course on how they are uh, designed, can trigger more or less uh, empathy in us. And good design at all, sca all scales is human-centered and takes in consideration this as the most important aspect. So not only efficiency and things well organized and put in the right place and everything running smoothly, no accidents and so on. But most importantly, this idea of, of having the possibility of having a sense of place, a sense of connection and uh, a sense of being f fully human. Um, this would be one, one way to, to describe it. So, um, so in architecture and interior design, we, we see many uh, researchers and many people who are changing this uh, paradigm and this approach to architecture, interior design, so to, to the built environment and also to design in general, not just for the object, how we design an object to look like, to feel like, to smell like and so on, but to take all these aspects in consideration, thinking about the experience of the user and this uh, capacity we have for empathy and for connection 
uh, with our uh, environment, which is fundamental and, and uh, a real necessity that we have for our well-being. And that's, uh, and that's the focus of, of uh, ergonomics also, to really um, so design, uh, support the design of products and environments that support as much as possible the human well-being so that we don't don't just survive in our environment but that we can uh, thrive and uh, be happy and this is the end of our cycle of lectures uh, on ergonomics i it was my great pleasure to prepare them for you and i hope you enjoyed this experience as much as possible it was enjoyable for me and also a big challenge because this was a completely new setup i had never made a youtube channel before these are this is all completely completely new and uh, i did not do online teaching before and although we are not as connected as we would be in a classroom I still think that considering the situation uh, of the corona lockdown that we can use the tools we have av available to us to as much as possible remain uh, connected and um, also another possibility is that we can preserve the knowledge and we can distribute it and make it useful uh, and, and share thoughts and ideas globally so I hope not just the students for whom these videos were meant for uh, learned and enjoyed this experience, but also whoever comes across these videos, um, that it's an interesting and enjoyable experiencing too, and, and a rewarding experiencing too. That was my intention. So thank you very much. And if you are interested in learning more, keep subscribed to the Corporal Architecture channel, which will have more content. Uh, about body and uh, building and performance in the future. Thank you.